the difference in decision making is not due to the uh, lack of logic and reasoning, but more due to the immaturity of the psychological capacities in the children when we mm. are growing up. And uh, so they have the underdeveloped capacity such as um, delayed gratification or uh, regulating their emotions or uh, controlling the impulse, for example, mm -hmm. right? So they have a different um, physiology or how their brain works. So I'm just thinking in that case, how can we effectively teach a good decision-making to, to, to teenagers at least, if not the very young kids? Well, part of making better decisions is Hello everyone, welcome to the Being Yourself show where we learn from the people who have followed their passion to achieve great success and have impacted many lives. If you're new here, then please do consider subscribing to this channel. This episode is being recorded in association with Let's Localize, an organization with a mission to foster micro contributions from communities and businesses to help schools with their need of time, skill, and funding. To know more about Let's Localize, click on the card above or the link in the description section below. I'm your host, Ajay Mathur, and my guest today is a TEDx speaker, an American venture capitalist, and author of two best-selling books, The 10% Entrepreneur and FOMO, which was released in 2020. His podcast called FOMO Sapien is directly broadcasted by Harvard Business Review, and has got more than 2 million downloads. Not just FOMO, but he has also coined a term called fear of better option, which is all about decision making. He has been featured in various media outlets, including the Financial Times, Harvard Business Review, New York Times, Inc., Guardian, just to name a few. So please welcome the person, the only person I know who has created a word for the Oxford English Dictionary, Patrick Maginis. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So before we deep dive into the fear and go into the world of the fear, I would like to know from you, tell us our audience, although they would know, but I want them to hear it from the creator himself, what are FOMO and FOBO? Sure. FOMO is fear of missing out. It is an anxiety created by the fear that there's something better happening than what you're doing right now, combined with a fear of being excluded from a group experience. Um, FOBO, fear of a better option, is an anxiety created by the fear uh, that there's something better out there when you're making a decision. So you're trying to choose between perfectly acceptable options. Um, but you think, oh, there might be something better. I should keep searching. And so you, you keep looking and looking, and you never commit. So FOMO versus FOBO. FOMO is about trying to do everything and going crazy trying to do everything whereas, and, and having no focus. Whereas FOBO is about wanting the perfect thing, wanting to maximize and then therefore actually never doing anything. What inspired you to go so deep into this? I believe you were, after your MBA, you were working in financial industry in Wall Street, isn't it? Yeah, so I came out of Harvard Business School and I was working on Wall Street. And it's uh, basically, I was of, in the middle of the financial crisis in 2008, and that caused me to write my first book about um, part-time entrepreneurship. And then as I was traveling the world on book tour, everybody wanted to talk about FOMO and how I created FOMO because it's such a global concept. And so I realized that uh, it was actually a pretty big problem that affects people all over the world in all aspects of their lives, and that somebody needed to talk about that to give people the tools to live more decisively. Hmm. And uh, how come FOMO became more popular than FOBO? Because the fear of better option is about the decision making, which to me looks like more important than just fear of missing out. Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's really no way of knowing why one has become more popular than the other. Uh, there's no way to trace that. But my guess is that um, you know, it started out, it's a word that I came up with when I was an MBA student. And MBA students, should, they have both FOMO and FOBO, but I think the FOMO is even a bigger part of life at that point because you're sort of at a different point in your life. You're at a point when you have the energy to do everything and you are living in a very choice switch environment. And so therefore, you try to keep up and you're sort of in a mindset where more experiences means that's better 
um, and that you want to try a lot of different things. Later on, as you get more busy and you have more money and you have more options and you have more of a sense of like, you know, what you want, you become pickier. And so therefore FOBO is something that tends to happen a little later in life. So that's why I think um, FOMO is a much more, uh, it's a much more um, relatable term for a mass market because everybody can fill FOMO. We can all look at our phone and mm. see what some Instagram influencer is doing. But FOBO is something that's, it's something that is, is um, it's become more common as we've had more choices over the years, thanks to the internet, but it, it isn't something that everybody feels as deeply. Mm. And are they exactly the, I'm just thinking of the scientific or psychological definition of a fear. Mm -hmm. Do they sit in the same sort of fear definition? Yeah, they're both about anxiety. Anxiety that, that, that causes us to make decisions or not make decisions based on the fear that we will do the wrong thing. So I, I think they're you know, highly related. Mm, and I believe that uh, sooner or later, they will come in the top 10 list of fears then. <laughs> I mean, I, have, I, I feel like I deal with them all the time as most people do. And so it's sort of the thing that once you know the words, I think if you don't know the word and you've never heard of FOBO, um, mm. when you do hear about it, you sort of think, wow, that's amazing because if you're the person who struggles with what to put on in the morning or what to watch on television or, or what to buy on Amazon, um, then, you know, because you have so many choices uh, and you just keep searching and searching, then you have FOBO. So when, you know, when we are born, we only born with two fears. One is the fear of loud noises. And I think other is fear of falling. Mm -hmm. Where do we catch this fear of missing out? It looks like, looks like it's a quite, uh, elder fear, if you see it from the age and how people grow up. When first time you think people do get into this, this sort of uh, behavior? I mean, it starts pretty early, actually. If you ever try to put a small child to bed, um, they don't want to go to bed because they want to be there taking part in the experiences. And so mm. we are biologically predisposed to feel FOMO. In fact, the earliest humans were very aware of what other people had and what they needed in order to survive. So they were keenly aware they compare themselves to others, they observe the outside world and then wanted to partake in things. Um, that's been part of humanity since early on. And, and it's something that um, young people feel, obviously the first time you get your, um, you get that, you know, your cell phone or the first time you go to a party or, you know, it's so exciting. It's, and, and a lot of what creates FOMO is, is the, um, the, it's the perception that there's something better out there for you, right? Perception is based on um, emotion and it, it, it's based on you inventing a story in your head. It may be that you hear about something like, oh, I wanna go to this concert or I wanna go to this party or I wanna go do this thing. It may be that you wouldn't actually like it, but in your head, it looks so amazing. So that's something that everybody can feel. And I think young people are, because they have less, less life experience actually, are more likely to have a perception that is better than reality. You, as you grow up, you have more data points that you can factor into how you see something, right? But what has made FOMO something that, that is sort of universal and that's gone back since the earliest humans to something that is really pervasive today and problematic is mm -hmm. uh, technology, connectivity, uh, reference anxiety, ability to compare yourself to people. You can go online and see what people are doing all over the world right now and start to feel like, well, your life isn't good enough and what do you need to do to com compete with them? And so that's where it comes from these days. And what about fear of better options? When do we first pick that up? So fear of better options is something that I think has been really, uh, I mean, uh, humans are maximizers. We always sort of, have, we have a natural tendency to want to have the best even if we don't even know what the best is, right? So you see people who are constantly looking to trade up and, and um, negotiate. And, and you see that a lot in cultures around the world, always negotiating everything, right? Um, and I think that's something that you see sometimes in South Asian culture as well, actually. There's a real tendency to negotiate and try to get a better deal, better deal. And that's kind of a funny thing to, for, for uh, as Americans, we're sometimes afraid to ask for that, right? So it's a really fun cultural difference. And, and it makes sense, right? But, and that's not necessarily a problem. The problem is when that gets into, you get into a situation where you have so much choice, whether it's going on to Netflix, whether it's going on to buy something online, where in the old days, you know, pre-internet, you went to a bookstore and there were 200 books to choose from and you could decide. Now there are 2 million books to choose from. And so you're so overwhelmed with choice that um, the, the technology, the internet has really given us uh, so much choice that we, we, we really struggle to choose. Yeah. But uh, you know, the, the psychology behind 
the fear of better option. I'm just trying to understand that mm -hmm. because now is the generation which loves instant gratification, mm -hmm. right? Whereas FOBO is just kind of opposite, right? You are delaying the gratification by not choosing something now, isn't it? So is, yeah. is there a contradiction there? There may be, but the reality is that even if you want instant gratification and you, and you value that, if you're unable to parse between a number of things and you fear that by choosing something now you're foregoing some future benefit, then you end up stuck. And that's, I think what happens is um, instant gratification is something as I think about it, you know, it, it, it can be something that um, you want, but you don't necessarily get. And I think that happens a lot with, um, with, with people who seek instant gratification is yeah, they'll, they're in, they're in search of it and they value it, but it doesn't necessarily, first of all, make them happy. Or second of all, it's not even clear that they're able to achieve that goal. Mm. And, and why is decision-making so tough? I think it's because everybody thinks they're good at it. So one thing that's kind of fun as I talk about this book, and I made a TED video last year that has done like, I don't know, over a million views at this point. And I read the comments and everybody says, well, they disagree, not everybody, but some people disagree and they say, well, my wife makes decisions like you said. And, and, you know, I think that the reason she struggles is because of the way she was raised or whatever those things are, but I make good decisions because I do these things. And I think it's one of these things where we make decisions all the time. All of us are making thousands of decisions a day, probably more that we think, oh, I'm pretty good at this. Right. But the reality is we don't, oftentimes even think systematically about how we make decisions. And so therefore it's something that we do all the time, but rarely think about why and how we do those things. And so it's only when we get stuck on the really big things that we start to struggle and, and seek help. But what we fail to realize is that many of us spend a lot of time and energy making decisions on things that don't matter every day, that basically take time away from us, that make us less effective, that give us stress. And so I, I think I think it's, it, there's a real need to appreciate that, um, that this is not something that you're necessarily just good at, that you have to work at it. Mm. And uh, you have any three step or four or five step formula to make good decisions? I mean, that's, yeah, the whole book is about how to make better decisions, but just to, to give a couple of high level points, you know, one big yeah. thing about fear, fear of missing out and fear of a better option is that they're based on perception. When you see an opportunity or an option, it's you, you have this perception that there's something better out there for you. And so the first thing to do is really think about whether perception is deception. Is that thing as good as it looks? Have you done the work to figure out if it is something that actually will live up to what you've invented in your head? And in fact, that's really where the pathology exists is when what is going on in your head is disconnected from reality. And so there's a bunch of different ways to deal with that. Um, but a big part of it is to do the homework you need to figure out if that thing is even real or not. Second big thing, uh, and one of my favorite sort of tips um, that I use all the time is what I call asking the watch. Um, I, I believe there's really three types of decisions that we make. There are um, high stakes, low stakes, and no stakes decisions. No stakes decisions are things you won't even remember having decided in a week or, or a couple of days, like what am I having for lunch today? But oftentimes, and you know, you get stuck on those things. It's sort of like, well, you know, or should I have a salad or should I have a burger or should I go for a run today or should I take the day off? And it doesn't really matter. You should just do one or the other. What you shouldn't do is spend 30 minutes agonizing over it because you either, the, most of those decisions you make without even thinking about it. But if you're stuck, it means that, you know, you're basically wasting your time. So what I do is what I call ask the watch. I basically take my watch. I divide it into two halves, or you can do it with a cell phone with, with the time. And you say, okay, um, I'm going to go for a run. If the time is even, I'll go for, a, a, I won't go for a run. If the time is odd, you look at the time, it's 11.22. Well, it's even. I'm going to go for a run. I'm done. I do that with all kinds of small decisions. And basically what it does is it allows you the free time. Uh, you, you get clear things off your plate so that you can spend time on things that matter. I think that's a very simple yet very powerful solution. Mm. And it is difficult to implement sometimes because you will look at the watch and I don't know, how will you make it a habit that you, when you see the watch and it is telling you to do one thing, then you definitely do do that? You just have to commit to it up front. In fact, so I, this is what I did at my TED video about, but um, what I say in there, I believe, and, and it's true, is I've been doing this for, oh my goodness, now let me think about how long, 20 years, I guess. 
And I started this when I was really young and I've never gone against it. So I don't, you know, I would not ask the watch about like who I should marry or, or what job I should take. It needs to be for things that are not important, things that you can, um, that again, you wouldn't remember worrying about in a couple of days. And, and if you do that and you commit to it, it becomes something you believe in and it becomes a system that you use regularly. So when I do it, I know that I'm going to stick by it. Hmm. And um, are these, I mean, for the, for the high stake decisions, for example, mm -hmm. uh, do you have a separate method for organizations who have to make high stake decision but they're still uh, kind of got lost in analysis paralysis or not able to take the decisions? Is there any difference between doing it on individual level versus doing it at a firm level? No, I think it's very similar in terms of there's a whole strategy around FOBO and FOMO for high stakes decision that's like a multi-step kind of process that's really aimed at, on, it's attacking those basic causes of FOMO and FOMO. So like for FOMO, FOMO is about, um, it's about um, perception that something's better out there. So you need to think about whether that perception is reality. And the second is about wanting to be part of the crowd, not being left out of the herd. Um, a lot of times we feel FOMO because we see other people doing something and we don't want to be left out. And so whether it's at a personal level or at an organizational behavior level, it's important to think, to really attack each of those independently. So say you're a large company and you're thinking about, um, let's say for example, a great um, case study um, from the history of business is when um, uh, Pepsi in the 1990s, I think it was, uh, launched Crystal Pepsi. Uh, have you ever heard of Crystal Pepsi? No. Yeah, because it was a failure. Crystal Pepsi was basically Pepsi's attempt to, um, to copy Sprite. So they made a clear soda um, and it became a huge, it was mass. I remember as a kid, like it was a big deal and then everybody tried it and everybody hated it and we all, nobody drank it. And it was, it's like, it's kind of a crazy story. But, um, but what's funny about it is like, I really think it's a great example of FOMO. Like why did Pepsi feel the need to launch the soda? Well, you know, because it looked so great that there was this new sort of market segment, the clear soda was getting really popular. And so they jumped right into it. They put all these resources behind it, but they didn't really understand why they were doing it. They didn't have a good plan to make it a product that people would want. Um, and so in their, in, their, in their perception that this would be such a great thing for them and their fear of being left behind as other people moved into the space, they launched a product that didn't make sense for them and it failed. And this happens all the time. You think about Amazon launching the Fire Phone. You think about companies all the time that are trying to, to, to do things because it, it's, you know, it, it looks great at the moment. You know, like uh, Instagram launching Reels recently. I mean, my, from what I read, like Reels is not a great product. But it's, it's really about, it's about Facebook having FOMO and not wanting to be left behind when TikTok comes along and starts to become prominent. So, so um, you know, FOMO can be good because maybe it does encourage you to try something new, but if you don't think carefully about it and have a right strategy and make a good decision around it, then you could fail. But um, so if you, let's say if you don't, if Pepsi wouldn't have done, wouldn't have launched Crystal, Mm -hmm. and they would have waited to get something better, then they, you would say that they have fear of better options then? Not necessarily, because I, I think in the case of Crystal Pepsi, if you look at the way they made their decision, it wasn't thoughtfully done out. They hadn't done the work that they needed to do. And so it wasn't, it didn't resonate with their customer and with their brand. And that's where I think you get into trouble. Being, having FOMO means being a follower. It means doing something because other people are doing it, not because it's the right thing for you to do. Right. And that's what happens with something like a, a Crystal Pepsi. It could be, by the way, that, you know, Pepsi's gotten into like all kinds of, now, you know, they, they're into a much more diversified set of, of um, products, right? From juices and waters and stuff. And those work because they launched them appropriately and they put them under the right brand and they did it the right way and it was more thought out. And, and so it's, it's really about, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with launching new products and with trying to keep up with the competition. It's all about why you do it. What are your mo motivations mm. and how do you do it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking and relating it to that another example that he, you give in, gave in your another podcast about Audi and Tesla. Yeah, of course. Because that is the FOBO <laughs> example where Audi exactly. wanted to launch an electric vehicle, which is the right thing to do because that's the way the world is going. You have to keep up with the changes and the way that cars are going to be made. But it took them 10 years to launch a product because they never committed to one product because 
you know, it's a huge company, massive budgets, competing interests, and you can never coordinate everybody. And so everybody is, is, is sort of, they kept on changing the model because they thought they could find a better way, a better way, a better way. Meanwhile, Tesla, um, which has far fewer resources, goes out and launches a product and as much as, you know, the most valuable car company in the world now because they were decisive. They didn't sort of try a million different things without committing to anything. And so that's why startups beat big companies sometimes is because they have to focus. They have to be decisive. They don't have the luxury of, of uh, you know, doing what Audi did and trying a million different things without committing. Mm. Coming back on to the individual level, in one of your video you said that sabbatical can help you overcome the FOMO. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. In fact, that's a, a an article written, um, a guest article by my friend DJ Dona, uh, who's an expert on sabbaticals. <laughs> and I put that in my book uh, originally and then I read, I met him and, and I asked him to write a piece about it. You can find it on my, uh, on my blog and on LinkedIn. But basically, we, again, back, back to FOMO. FOMO is this, it's this um, perception there's something better out there. And so why don't you go explore that thing on a part-time basis? Take a little break. Say, say you know, you're, a, um, you're working in an industry. You're like, a, I don't know, investment banker. God help you. And your dream and you think what would be so great is to be a painter. Well, uh, rather than sort of leaving finance forever and becoming a painter and you know closing those doors and making an irrevocable change, why don't you take a sabbatical, try it out, see if you even like it, see if perception meets reality or perception is deception, and then you'll have better data to make a decision on. And so that's, so sabbaticals can do that for people. You know, it's, you see all these people, it's funny, I, 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 you know, I've seen a lot of people take sabbaticals. I took a sabbatical and you think that somehow you're, you know, your life is going to be so much better because you're doing something different than what you're doing all day, but you really don't know. And so you want to gather the information by living that life to see whether or not it actually is something you want to do. Actually, I had uh, one of my guests called Alex Peng, and he came up with the four-day work week kind of concept. And he has written a book also about it. And he, he did think about it first time and he was on sabbatical, surprisingly. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you, it is cool to do this. I took a year off, actually. Um, following the financial crisis because I got, it was so terrible. And, um, and I would say that what I learned as part of that is that it gives you um, the free time to be very creative. And one thing that's happening right now, of course, with the pandemic is that, you know, it's sort of like you can, um, you can sort of have a sabbatical. I mean, it's in the sense that like, you have a lot more free time, you're kind of stuck in one place. So like you could actually decide to, create a sort of mini sabbatical and use this time um, proactively to make better decisions and to learn more about yourself. Mm. In the decision making process, the, the way we make decision is different for small kids, it is different for teenagers, and it is different for the adults, mm. right? And I, I was reading one of the paper recently that the difference in decision making is not due to the uh, lack of logic and reasoning, but more due to the immaturity of the psychological capacities in the children when we mm. are growing up. And uh, so they have the underdeveloped capacity such as um, delayed gratification or uh, regulating their emotions or uh, controlling the impulse, for example, mm -hmm. right? So they have a different... Um, physiology or how their brain works. So I'm just thinking in that case, how can we effectively teach a good decision making to the to, to teenagers at least, if not the very young kids? Well part of making better decisions is making mistakes. Right. And trying things and learning that it wasn't what you wanted or it didn't make you happy because those those things give you the life experience to make better decisions later on. Like imagine for example, if you only ever tried one type of ice cream, okay, you're like only chocolate for your whole life. And then when you're 50 years old, you walk into an ice cream store and there's a hundred flavors. It would be very overwhelming. You'd want to try them all. You'd have FOBO, you'd have FOMO, you'd have so many things happening in your life. Now, if you were to slow as a kid, say you every year, you went to the ice cream store and there were two new flavors and you could try them bit by bit and make decisions and learn about what you like and don't like. 
that's how I think about decision making in, in all aspects of life. I think, you know, there is, you can read a thousand books about making decisions, but if you don't actually do it in real life and learn and make mistakes, you won't get better at it. But I do think that it's valuable for anybody from a young age to understand the concepts of FOMO and FOBO so that you can observe your behavior, learn from it and say, okay, am I making this decision based on what I really want to do? Or am I doing this based on FOMO or FOBO? Because that, what's so hard, especially, I mean, thinking back to your my teenage years, and I'm sure you can relate, and anybody watching this as a teenager, is like, there's all this peer pressure, right? It's like, oh my goodness, all my peers are doing this, right? You know, I, I it's, and being an individual is really hard at any age, but it's especially hard when you're, when you're growing up, because if you're a little different, people pick on you, they make fun of you. And so that's where you see people who maybe are really talented at something like really good at math or good at playing an instrument. Um, they, they don't even want to tell people because they, they feel like, oh, I'm weird or, you know, whatever. And I think that is, um, that's terrible. And so, if you start to say, you know, oh, you know, I, the reality is like, I don't even, you know, this thing that I think I should be doing, like, say you're really bad at sports, but you, you know, you want to play soccer, football, because everybody thinks that's cool. And you're like, you know what? I stink at football. Okay, fine. It's okay. You don't have to keep up with, you don't have to, if you're missing out, go focus that energy on something you actually are good at, because probably it'll make you successful and happy. And so mm. I think that's one thing I learned the hard way as a kid. Like I wasn't particularly good at like, baseball and I played baseball and it was awful. Like I wish I'd spent that time, I don't know, reading books, learning you know, calculus or something. <laughs> Uh, but this, you know what, the options that you have, I mean, you can do 10 different things that has become so prominent now. I mean, especially after the internet has come up and then yeah. you go on Amazon and you see like a hundred different options, as many as you want, really. How old is, of course, you coined the term, term but those kind of fear in some sort of different definition existed before uh, FOMO came, right? Yeah. How old are these uh, behaviors? Oh my goodness. I mean, they go back to the earliest humans. So if you didn't, if you were, uh, you know, sort of like homo habilis, homo erectus, and we're talking like a million and a half, two million years ago, mm. and you were not, you know, part of FOMO is comparing yourself with others and seeing what they have and then what you don't and trying to get that. If you, if you had, you, you know, if you're in the crowd and then you notice, oh, this, this group over here has a way better source of water. Um, oh, they're in a much better environmental situation. They've got like grassier plains or whatever. Um, you're gonna, you're nomadic. You're just gonna go over there, FOMO, right? Um, and if you get excluded from the group, remember FOMO is about a fear of being excluded. If you get excluded from the group, you can no longer have the information you need to survive, right? It's like all of a sudden you don't know like, oh, you know what? There's gonna be better grass over on the other end of the plain. Let's go over there, right? And so. That's why there was this desire. There was a real formation of groups and, and this nomadic lifestyle. So these things go back, um, go back to the earliest humans. They're part of our evolutionary biology. Mm. The problem is that they've just been accelerated by technology to the point where they create pathology. And, and that's where we don't want to be. Yeah. And I think in the caveman days, being in the group is actually important for your survival. Otherwise, you somebody might kill you. Yeah. Or... Sometimes I guess if you're in the group, they might just kill you anyway, but, but it definitely, there's a reason I just read a great book about sort of evolution and biology. There's a reason, I mean, these social structures didn't just happen. They were, they were a reflection like anything else of the realities of the time, the environment, the need to survive. And so humans optimize in different organizations. Like later on when um, people could um, had figured out how to, you know, live an agrarian lifestyle, they could just stay in one place. They didn't need to go anywhere. They didn't need to live in a group. They could form a nuclear family and they could have children and the ch they would keep their children to, with them. And then those kids would work in the fields and like it changed the whole way society was organized. But, but you know, we are, we are always going to be a reflection of the environmental factors in our society. And right now a big factor is technology and how it shapes our, our, our decision-making in our lives. Yeah. I mean, this relates very well with a lot of other um, evolutions that humans are going through. Uh, food is one example, because people used to eat as per the need and as per what was available. Now that has changed, but our behavior hasn't really changed. And um, and yeah, the, the, the you know now if you are not in the group, 
you're not going to be killed, right? No, I mean, you <laughs> but you still have that fear, <laughs> isn't it? That's quite interesting. So that uh, brings me to this uh, FOMO sapien thing, right? So you have this podcast called FOMO sapien. Uh, cool name. I really loved it. Thanks. <laughs> and you ask a lot of your guests about what makes you a FOMO sapien. Can I ask you the same question to you? Sure. Oh, my goodness. Uh, everything. <laughs> uh, I am naturally, I mean, the reason why I came up with this term is because I have tons of FOMO and, and I, I actively manage my FOMO. I really do. Like I'm very aware of it, but I, it's just part of who I am. So it's like, you know, just like I have blonde hair, I have tons of FOMO. And I think the thing uh, that gives me FOMO is like socializing human connection. When I hear about events happening, I want to be there. Even, you know, there was like the being at home during the pandemic for me was like a really great challenge because um, I don't mind being alone, but definitely, you know, I, I love to be out and about at events with people, talking, mixing it up, learning. And so um, that's, if I hear about an opportunity, like I, I happened to me today, I got invited to this really interesting uh, event on Zoom with a bunch of really fascinating people. And it's like, I moved all my calendar so I could be there. So that's, that's, that's me. There I am. <laughs> that, that's very natural. And I think that's, that's good also, isn't it? In some ways, because you don't want to regret later that you missed out on that particular opportunity. Yeah, it's good to a point, but like anything else, I mean, I, I can tell you that I've had many a night in my life where I went to like five things, mm. you know, literally like had to like map it out, you know, starting and this way where I started in business school is like, I grew up in a very quiet place in the state of Maine in the United States. There wasn't a lot going on. It's very chill. Whenever I go there, I basically like sleep all the time. And then when you go to like a place like Harvard or New York city, you have so many options and the challenge is not to shortchange those options. If you try to do five things, you're going to basically spend 15 minutes at each event and then the rest of the time running around. And so there's no value to that either. You've got to find and commit and, and, and be present in the moment and not be at one event and looking at the phone and seeing what's going at the next so you can leave. And that's what I think was really annoying about people with FOMO and that I try to avoid is that you're not present in anything. You're not focused. You're all over the place. And therefore, you don't actually enjoy any of the opportunities that, you are, that you're given. How did you manage to, well, I don't know, maybe you didn't do it, it just happened. How did the word got into Oxford Dictionary? What is the procedure? Yeah, I mean, it's a totally wild story, but basically I wrote an article about FOMO and FOBO in 2004 in the school newspaper of Harvard Business School. And then I graduated and then um, it was a very popular article and it was, everybody talked about it and they started using the term and it stayed popular at, at HBS. So it became a term that was used at the school to the point where it also started spreading to other MBA prog programs. And then as people would graduate, they would take it into the Wall Streets and the consulting firms and the tech firms. And it became sort of this MBA lingo that spread. And then it was written about in Business Week in 2007. It was written about a book in 2008. And slowly it just grew, 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 grew till it became, you know, sort of hit this tipping point. And then it was included in the dictionary and many dictionaries. It's unlike all kinds of dictionaries, it's like all the dictionaries. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, these kind of new words first come in the Urban Dictionary. I think there is a website. I don't know if it still exists. It was. It's actually, it was in the Urban Dictionary mm. first um, okay. in like 2008, maybe. I mean, you can find it if you look it up. But what's so funny is that, um, you know, I had no control over this. It's just happened. You cannot make these things happen. Virality happens because of everybody else. And so I was just, you know, blown away at what happened with FOMO. It's kind of mind blowing. Okay, so it's a little bit out of context, but I can see a lot of books behind you now. Yes. And I would like, and so I can assume that you're a avid reader. I would like to know how reading has changed your life. Oh, I love that question. It's fantastic. And no, nobody's ever asked me that question, even though it's such a basic question, you know what I mean? Oh, there, I, I, so when I was a kid, I read, I, I was, I'm very competitive um, with, with myself and others. And so I used to have a, I remember I would read a book a day. I would read for hours a day, like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. It was incredible. Um, and then um, as I got older, um, I, I, you know, I found that books really 
gave me a sense of the wider world. So I, um, as a kid, you know, getting into, like the reason I moved to New York was because I read Bright Lights, Big City. The reason I went to Argentina is I read a book with that, stuff like that. I just, I, I love reading and it's something that like, I can't stop a book once I read it. I just read the, like three books in rapid succession and I read them all in like two days. I read this book called Pachinko. I read the book called The Namesake. Um, and like once I pick them up, I can't put them down. And so I tend to like these days, um, I don't get to read as much as I want because I'm really, I'm unable to like pull myself out of books. So I have to be strategic. But I would say these days, I also use books to practice languages, which is really great. Um, so I, I, you know, I speak Spanish and French and Portuguese. So I, the way I keep my language up is to read books in those languages. And uh, so there's all kinds of things. Books are great for stories. They're great for learning things, but they can also serve other purposes. And like I talk about um, in the book, this concept of going all in some of the time. If you want to learn language, follow a newspaper on Twitter that's in that language. You get a little taste, little snacks every day in that language. Part of what I do for my languages to keep my language going is to read books in those in that language. And so yeah. What are your top three books that come at top of your head oh, when I goodness. ask about books? Uh, on the fiction side, I love um, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's such a, I mean, I read that, I remember reading that as a kid. I reread that every once in a while. I also love this book called Bright Lights, Big City um, by Jay McInerney. And then on the nonfiction side, I just read this wonderful book that if you haven't read it, everybody should read. It's called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's okay. all about how to find strength in the face of adversity. Uh, it's a very, I, and I've talked about it. It's something that everybody's been reading at this time in the pandemic because it's like yeah. a powerful book. And in fact, so many of my guests on the podcast have talked about it. Um, the other one that I truly love, I'll just pull it out, is this book called The Happiness Advantage mm -hmm. by Sean Acor. Mm -hmm. um, this is what I think this book does. Oh my goodness. You know what's fun? I just found, I hide money in books and I just found <laughs> a bunch of money. This is amazing. I'm gonna wow, congrats. <laughs> wow. Now, I guess any thieves know where to find my money. Uh, <laughs> so the reason I love that book is because it's sort of a user-friendly guide to positive psychology. Mm. And positive psychology is something that you mentioned earlier. It's something that I've just discovered in the last year yeah. and that I just love. So I think it's a really interesting introduction to that field. Yeah, it's a really powerful concept. I loved it myself. Yeah. Okay, right. So one common question that I asked all my guests, Patrick, that is, what are the top three skills according to you, which one needs in order to grow and be successful, but those skills are not taught in schools? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, okay. I would say... Skills empathy, or behaviors. Empathy. Mm -hmm. Not taught at school, sadly. Um, I would say, oh, uh, flexibility. Hmm. And I would say, um, creativity. Could you I mean, it's a little bit taught in schools, but, but not yeah. widely. Could you elaborate a little bit on each of those, like, 20 seconds on each. Yeah, sure. Uh, empathy, I think that understanding, being able to, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see how they see the world is so critical to not just to being a good human being, but also to be able to create things that other people want and desire in, 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 the, in the world. So um, if, you're, if you're completely unaware of what other people are thinking and feeling, you're not going to be able to do anything that's relevant for them. Um, in terms of, did I say the second was resilience, did I say? I can't remember. Flexibility. Um, Flexibility, kind of like resilience. Yeah, flexibility. I just think right now, I was had, I had this conversation yesterday with an entrepreneur. One thing we've all learned is people, so many people are, were un, like are in, so many people have been flexible during the pandemic and tried new things and like everybody moved to Zoom and whatever, you know, learn new things. But I, I see um, uh, companies and people who haven't changed the way they do things. Like I was talking to a friend of mine whose kids are in school and they're still trying to teach as if it's like, the way it was last year and they haven't changed the way they're doing things and it's failing. You must be flexible. Flexibility 
um, you think about people 100, 200 years ago, like you're, you're from India, like your ancestors when during the partition, if they had been inflexible and just said, well, I'm not leaving, um, they couldn't have, it would have been, they, they had to just embrace the change and it was yeah. difficult and suffering yeah. happened. But like, look at where the country is today. Um, it's, you know, vibrant. And then um, creativity. creativity, I just feel like uh, it's very hard to be, to achieve greatness in life without being a little creative. But more than that, it's hard to have fun. Like if you can't make every day in your life a little fun in one way or the other, in a creative way, you're going to be kind of boring and, and you're going to be bored. So I truly believe, and I use this all the time, I, I, I'm constantly looking for ways to make my life more fun. And I'm creative about those ways. And it yeah. makes me a happier person. Yeah, definitely. And at the end of the day, everybody wants to be happy. Yes. Although what is happiness? That's another conversation <laughs> we'll have one day. Yeah, maybe in the next podcast. <laughs> right. So you have, uh, you have had a good, successful venture capitalist career. You have authored two best-selling books. What next? Well, first of all, I'm going to count all this money. I mean, who you knew? Found- <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> was it, was uh, it just not one note, right? Is it more, more than no, one? No, it's, it's, let's see, 20, oh. 40, 60, 80, 100. It's like $250. I hit it at the beginning of the pandemic because I didn't wow. know if we'd have like a financial crisis. So I hid <laughs> money all over my apartment, but I forgot where. And so I've been finding it like randomly. It's so funny. Um, that's, that's insane. Uh, embarrassing, but you know, I'll share with you guys. Uh, what's next? So, you know what, it's been, um, it's been a crazy year for everybody and I've had to be flexible like, you know, many of us have. And so I want what I, you know, I think that the, it's, I, I want to continue. I think because people were distracted right now with many other things, it's been hard to get the message out about the book. So I really want to kind of in the new year, kind of launch the book again and then, you know, continue doing what I'm doing. I, I actually want to just do more of the same things because I really love them and try to uh, do less of the things that, um, that, I, that I don't like doing. That's all. Any plan of writing a book on FOBO as well? I don't know. I, you know, I thought about, should I write a whole book about FOMO, a whole book about FOBO? And I think there could be another follow-up book. But what I learned from last time is that um, the next book isn't going to be decided by me. The next book will be what I learn from people who read this book about what they want to hear from me next. And so, it, you know, I believe that, you know, the best ideas come from listening to people who are reading and, con- you know, kind of looking at the stuff that I'm doing. And I listen to their questions and then I say, okay, that's really interesting. And I think one of the things that, you know, I, I think the 10% Entrepreneur, my first book, is so much more relevant now than it was a year ago because of everything that's going on. So I may go back and explore that again. Um, we'll have to see, but I can guarantee that whatever it has to do, it'll be something that will be um, something that's applicable to people's lives and um, that you know helps people to, to make better choices. Definitely. Definitely. Right. So I, I, I think I do still have a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, I would ask you my final question, which is how can people reach you? Okay. So you can find me in so many ways, but uh, one way, a good way is my website, which is patrickmcginnis.com. I'm on Instagram and my Instagram, I promise is it's very exciting. Uh, Patrick J. McGinnis, uh, Twitter at PJ McGinnis. And then my, my uh, book is Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. The first one is um, 10% Entrepreneur, which is out all over the world. Uh, and then my podcast, which you can get wherever you get your podcasts, is called FOMO Sapiens. And we're launching a new season in October. And we're starting our season with a guy who is wonderful, who you may have heard of called Jay Shetty. So Jay Shetty is going to be on the show. He's a total amazing human being. And um, I'm really excited to do that with him. Wow. Good. Looking forward to that. Okay. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your time. It was a really interesting conversation. I learned a lot about the different fears. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks for your questions and and for, uh, for spending time today. Good luck. Thank you. Everybody, if you are looking to know more about FOMO or 
anything to do with the how to make better decisions, then I would highly recommend to go and check out uh, Patrick's website and all the other resources that he has just discussed. I will put all the links in the description below. And if you have not yet done so, then please do consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you get notification to all my future videos. So thank you very much for your time and till next time, goodbye.